to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Hello and welcome to Tales and Trails, I'm Nini Menon. Today we put the spotlight on a man who you would think really needs no introduction, Akbar the Mughal Emperor. He's always been described as Akbar the Great, but how much do we really know about him? And what is the legacy that he left behind? Ira Makoti's new book, Akbar the Great Mughal, tries to answer these questions. And Ira joins me today. Ira, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, what a lovely book you've written. It really opens up so many nuances uh, in Akbar's life and also the many other people who played a pivotal role in making him Akbar the Great. Uh, where did this journey of rediscovery take you and what are the jewels that you found along the way? Hello, Minnie. Yes, so one of um, my aims in writing this biography of Akbar was to present uh, Akbar in a new and layered and textured manner for the reader so that they would discover Akbar as he grew and as his ideas shaped around him. Uh, so, you know, in terms of sources, we already know about the Persian sources, we know about the Jesuit writings, and we know about the European sources. Um, but a less well-known source of history uh, is the miniature painting. As you know, the, the Mughals produced a great deal of miniature paintings, and due to the work of art historians in recent decades, this in itself has become a source of history to us. Um, and one of the fascinating things I discovered was a particular painting made in the early years in Kabul when Humayun was still Pacha trying to recover his kingdom uh, and there's a painting made uh, at this court which depicts a young prince Akbar himself presenting a painting to his father to Humayun and if you look at the painting within the painting it actually depicts that very same painting which shows that this was in fact a very important moment in Akbar's life and probably was a painting that the prince himself had contributed to himself so I love this idea of the young prince Akbar learning to paint under one of the great Persian masters and spending hours in uh, becoming proficient at this art. Uh, as we now know, he did uh, learn how to paint. So these are the little details that come out through uh, looking at art history, for example. How interesting. You know, uh, in your book, you talk about how uh, there was little to show of Akbar's uh, potential brilliance early on in his life. Uh, he was quite a, a normal kid. Some have said uh, he was even dyslexic uh, when he was a child. What do you think were the turning points that went on to shape him to becoming what he finally did become. So as a child, Akbar actually escaped the classical education that would have been given a Timurid prince like himself. Um, as a consequence, he spent his childhood running around the countryside of Kabul and spending a lot of time with his animals. Now, he was fascinated by the animals and the natural world around him. And I think in a sense that actually helped to create the Akbar that became uh, the mature man because he spent many hours understanding animals testing them and in a sense developing this curiosity and scientific spirit which was to become a hallmark of his empire. For example, he, the biggest animal that he had in Kabul was the camel and he would spend hours testing the speed of the camel, making it go very fast, making it eat all kinds of thorny bushes to see if it was able, uh, capable of eating these things. And so he developed almost the scientific spirit of inquiry, this uh, reasoning, this ability to analyze things about him and to understand the world viscerally through his own experiences with the world which in fact shaped the man that he was to become right you know when we when we talk of Akbar we often talk Ira about him as a visionary of his philosophical search in life etc but he was also a very uh, smart military uh, strategist uh, in fact under him the Mughal Empire expanded he was responsible for the defeat of the sultans of Gujarat, Malwa, the East in Bihar and Bengal, and of course, Ahmednagar. Uh, what has your research pulled out in terms of his military exploit? So we all know Akbar as this military man of genius, which he was. He used innovation and technology in all kinds of new ways. But what I found most interesting with Akbar was the way he used psychology once again to undermine his opponents. Uh, for example, the Gujarat campaign, which he conducted in the middle of the worst of the summer heat. Uh, because it was so hot, they couldn't travel in the daytime. So they took uh, camels and traveled at night. And they covered such a great distance in such a short amount of time, I think eight or nine days. 
So then by the time he arrived in Gujarat, his opponent was shocked by the very physical presence of the emperor himself. He couldn't believe the emperor had arrived so fast. And I think he lost the battle at that very moment. Um, similarly, when he went to fight uh, Daud Khan Afghan in Patna, he crossed the country in the middle of the monsoon season, which was unheard of. Usually kings waited till after the monsoon in the short winter months. So the way in which he threw aside all the rules of war, um, to me, that was a very important part of the psychology he used, you know, to undermine his opponents. So that by the end of it, after a few famous campaigns, he didn't even need to go to battle at all. He, his very appearance would strike terror in people's hearts and they would often submit uh, before having to go into battle uh, directly. So that was something that I found extremely interesting to understand about him, uh, the way in which he was able to avoid battles by using this terrific psychological force that he had. Right. You know, there is a tendency uh, uh, today, uh, Ira, to look back uh, on our medieval history and look at it uh, through the lens of Islam versus the rest. Uh, how uh, Mughals, uh, like Akbar, attacked Hindus, took over dominion, etc. But actually, if you look at it, battle doesn't really know any creed. It's all about dominion. It's all about control. And uh, Akbar fought some really vicious wars against the Sultanate of Gujarat, against Kashmir, against Malwa. Uh, so uh, when you hear of such stuff, what comes to your mind? So this manner that we currently have, or some sections currently have, of viewing people solely according to their religion, Hindu versus Muslim, for example, is something that didn't exist in the 16th century. In fact, it didn't exist until the 19th century, until the British came uh, in 1818, I think, and developed the system of dividing India into uh, a, a Hindu period, a Muslim period, and then a British period. In the 16th century, we had very complex identities. So people were linked uh, through culture, through geography, through clan, through community, through trade, through food, through language, through many, many ways. You know, your identity was made up of a great many different things, and your religious identity was not necessarily your main one at all. So often you had a uh, Rajput fighting against a Rajput, or a Muslim fighting against a Muslim king. And um, similarly, a Muslim king had, uh, you know, Hindus fighting for him like Akbar had uh, Raja Man Singh and many others, you know, and a, a Hindu king like uh, Hemu Vikramaditya, when he fought um, Bairam Khan, he had many, many uh, Afghan leaders in his contingent. So the world was a much more complicated place than we uh, give it credence for now. And the simplistic way of reducing people to their religious identities is a completely false one. Mm. You know, uh, Ira, the other fascinating thing about Akbar was, of course, his relationship with the Rajputs. Uh, from the chance marriage uh, to Harkabai when he was 20 to having Man Singh as one of his closest ally. Few people realize that uh, the, his son and grandson, Jahangir and Shah Jahan, had uh, Rajput mothers as well. Uh, so tell me, uh, what according to you worked for the Akbar Rajput alliance to be so strong? So Akbar uh, met the Rajputs when he was still a very young man. You know, he was about 20 uh, years of age when he met Raja Bharmal and married uh, Harkabai and met uh, Man Singh, who was Kuwar Man Singh at that time. So because he was such a young man at that time, I think the Rajputs uh, had a very strong influence on Akbar. You can see an incident uh, dated uh, to, I think, this period in the Gujarat campaign uh, when they go to Surat, I believe. and. Um, uh, Akbar and his men are sharing a few drinks in the evening and they're talking about exploits or bravery and the Rajputs tell him about uh, this tradition they have of holding a double-edged uh, lance in their hand and two Rajputs from either end throw themselves at the lance and pierce themselves. I'm not sure what it is meant to prove aside from personal bravery, but Akbar was very moved by this um, incident and wanted to recreate it himself, but luckily he was uh, stopped from doing so by Kuwar Man Singh. But this shows that Akbar Akbar greatly valued uh, physical courage. You know, he himself was an extremely um, courageous man on the battlefield. And if people could follow him into battle in this manner, which the Rajputs did, uh, then he was very admiring of this. He also greatly valued personal loyalty, which uh, all his Rajput commanders showed to him. So this was something that he appreciated a great deal. Uh, and the fact that he married uh, Rajput women, let's, let us not forget that that was also a source of great influence on the young Akbar, you know, and he took on many of the mannerisms. He was exposed to their food, to their religion, to their traditions, and he himself, in his manner, uh, took on many of these things. So the influence of the Rajputs were, were clear on, uh, on Akbar in many, many ways. Right. 
You know, uh, the other uh, interesting facet I found was uh, the economic might of uh, the Mughals under Akbar. Uh, they were greater than the Safavids of uh, Persia, the Ottoman Turks. Uh, but uh, you haven't stressed too much on the other great contemporary of uh, Akbar, that is Elizabeth I in England. Uh, were there any points of contact between the two? So Akbar was, in fact, uh, an exact contemporary of Elizabeth I, but uh, the two contacts that they did have during the reign of Akbar shows us um, which side, uh, you know, the, the wealth and the glory was tilted towards. It was definitely towards Mughal India. Um, both these times, emissaries were sent to the, to the Mughal court, and the first one was, I think, in 1584 which was an emissary headed by one John Newberry, and they come asking for trade concessions. So not much is gained by them at this time, uh, but one of the jewelers in their retinue, William Leeds, is offered a job uh, at the Mughal court because clearly, you know, there are a lot of jewels in the Mughal court and a lot of jewelry needs to be made. Um, uh, so uh, nothing much uh, comes of this uh, mission. And the second one is in 1599, um, when one um, Mildenhall arrives at the court and again um, tries to ask for trade concessions, which he doesn't get because he gets into an argument with the Jesuit uh, missionaries who were there. Um, and so, but both these contracts show us that it was very much uh, England at this time looking to the riches of the Mughal Empire and in ways in which they could get a small inroad into the Mughal Empire so as to get uh, some of that wealth. It was at this time at least not at all the other way around. Let's move on to Akbar at the personal level. You know, he had a very troubled relationship with his sons as well as his grandsons. What accounts for that? After all, he was a man who uh, spotted talent and got such great people around him. Why did he fail as a father according to you? So I think what happens sometimes is that when we view things uh, in the past, we tend to judge them with our 21st century perspectives. It's difficult to judge a parent uh, you know, in the 16th century, especially a monarch. Now, Akbar, when he was raising his sons, he had just done away with what he considered a very uh, dangerous system, which was the timurid system of co-sovereignty, which meant that any timurid prince, a cousin, an uncle, anybody could claim the throne. Um, so he had done this by keeping his sons very close to him at court and not giving them independent appanages, where usually you would be sent out when you were 8 or 9 or 10 years old to independently rule a region and learn how to become a king. Uh, Akbar countered this and he wanted to keep, his, so he kept his sons at court uh, and he looked after them. He took a personal interest in them when they were small. Uh, but as they grew up, and as they grew up, he appointed very powerful men uh, to become their guardians, you know, because he was clearly looking out for them and trying to make, uh, give them the best assets to become, uh, you know, uh, kings if that was their destiny. Uh, but the problem uh, with being very close to court when you have a king like Akbar is that it is obviously a very overpowering influence and his achievements were so great um, that it was uh, quite uh, to be expected that the sons felt that they could never live up to that. So two of his sons, Murad and Daniel, succumbed to alcoholism, probably because uh, the expectations were completely unrealistic for them. Um, but I don't think Akbar was necessarily a bad father. He was forming them to be able and capable princes and perhaps uh, leaders. You know, while Akbar was great and he left behind such a fabulous legacy, his son and grandson, Jahangir and Shah Jahan, didn't really follow his own path. Uh, why do you think that happened? Uh, was was uh, he uh, too large a figure in their lives? So when you have a figure like Akbar, I think it is inevitable that anybody coming after that pales in comparison. Um, but both Jahangir and Shah Jahan probably thought they were pretty worthy successors and timurid successors of Akbar. Uh, if you look at Jahangir, miniature paintings came to a state of perfection under his guidance. He was a great connoisseur of art, uh, a great patron of art, and he brought a Mughal miniature painting to a, a degree of perfection it had really not reached before, before then. Uh, as for Shah Jahan, he was a great patron of architecture. He was the great builder of the Mughals, whether it's the Taj Mahal or Old Delhi. Um, and both these these things, art and architecture, were things that were valued under the Timurids. So they were pro they probably felt that they were being very worthy Timurid successors to Akbar. But naturally, when you look at Akbar, uh, the holistic man and all that he was able to achieve, uh, nothing else quite uh, reaches that level of splendor. But right up till the time of Aurangzeb. Uh, all the great Mughals did try to promote the spirit of Sulekul, which meant uh, being kings to all the peoples of their empire equally, whatever their religion.
religious um, you know, tendencies. Uh, so this was something that did continue for a, a very long time and it was only uh, Aurangzeb who brought back the jizya uh, and uh, Jahanara Begum for one criticized him and, and pointed out uh, how necessary it was to, to, to keep it abolished. But they probably felt that they were being uh, you know, worthy successors to Akbar. As a biographer, you found some fabulous insights into Akbar, the fact that he cried openly, he loved with an open heart, and of course that he lost his school so often. As a biographer, what stood out for you in terms of his personality? I think what uh, struck me uh, a great deal about Akbar was um, how the, the opinion of the women around him mattered a great deal. For example, he had this old milk mother called Gigi Anga. She was old towards the latter part of his career. And her son was Mirza Aziz Koka. And there are two incidents in which my, Mirza Aziz Koka got away uh, with a lot of cheeky behavior because of who his mother was. The first time was when he criticized uh, a new system that Akbar had brought in, which was the branding of the horses. Now, uh, Aziz Koka was very opposed to this idea. And he criticized Akbar in open court now, this was something that Akbar would have tolerated for no one else uh, but Aziz Koka, you know. Uh, and all he did was confine him to his uh, garden mansion in Agra for the duration of, uh, you know, a few months. Um, and the second time, um, Aziz Koka again criticized uh, Akbar's religious innovations, and he gets so angry with him that he goes away to Mecca completely without permission and something which was, again, unheard of. Um, uh, but Akbar forgives him, and uh, Jahangir later on writes and says it was because of Gigi Anga, because Akbar loved her so much that he kept writing letters to Aziz Koka, begging him to come back to Hindustan, come back from Mecca, which Aziz Koka eventually does. And of course, Akbar forgives him. So I, I loved to discover the way in which these various women, and there are many of them, exert their influence in this very tender manner on Akbar. Right. You know, before I move on to my last question, Ira, I have to ask you, uh, there's so much uh, of uh, myth-making around Akbar and Birbal and the parables that we've all grown up listening to. Uh, tell me, is there any truth in that? And where did this uh, myth or this legend of this Akbar-Birbal uh, repartee come from? So around 1556 or thereabouts, a Brahmin named Mahesh Das joins the court and he soon earns the name of Kavirai, king of poets. And this gives us some clue to what sort of person this Mahesh Das was. He was clearly a great poet of Brajbhasha. He was a witty man. He was a charming man. He was very generous. And all these traits were something that made him an ideal Mughal courtier. This generosity of spirit, this repartee, you know, rep verbal repartee was greatly admired at the court. And he soon earned another title, which was Virva, which meant famed warrior. And that became Birbal. And he was somebody who was clearly a confidant of the kings, very close to him because Badawni, who was very critical of Akbar, said that uh, the, it soon became a case of thy blood is my blood, thy flesh is my flesh in terms of Birbal and Akbar. So the two men were clearly very close to each other. Uh, and how this became uh, the myth of Akbar Birbal, I think it was just a case of uh, people trying to um, make this character of Akbar, somebody who is so huge in their subconsciousness, somebody more vulnerable, more human, uh, more down to earth, if you like. So these stories become exaggerated. A mullah, do piazza becomes uh, created. Um, and this Birbal and Akbar interaction uh, is exaggerated. And I think that's how these myths came about. Right, that's interesting. Last question, Ira, before we say goodbye to you. Uh, you know, we live in troubled times. Uh, and looking back, Akbar was genuinely great. I mean, he was quite a visionary. What is the legacy uh, of Akbar in today's India? I think the one lesson uh, that we can take away from Akbar uh, is his message of Sulekul. When he realized uh, what a diverse country he had to rule, he made such a huge attempt to understand himself, to understand the other, and to understand what caused dissension and strife. And he understood that it was a misunderstanding between various religious groups that meant that they were sometimes at war with each other. And this didn't just remain uh, you know, empty theorizing. He brought in practical measures uh, to overcome these difficulties. He translated the great uh, Hindu epics, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Panchantantra, many other uh, works into Persian so that people could read them widely and understand Hindu philosophy. 
he brought in talented men from all religions into the uh, you know mughal mansabdari system and in every way he could he pushed this idea forward that kings were there to protect the big and the small people of all religions and i think that is probably the biggest takeaway that we can have uh, you know from the mughal empire from akbar and a lesson that would be so useful for us even today in our troubled times Thank you.